Hello guys, welcome back to Ox Angel RC. Amidst these My Fly Dream videos, I decided to do something different for a change. So in this video, I will give you a complete guide to the Matek F405 wing controller, including how to flash it with Arduplane, how to install and wire it, and how to set up Arduplane for first use, and also how to set up a V-tail because that was something a few people mentioned and also because I will finally be giving my XUAV clouds a very much deserved and long overdue upgrade. The clouds is still sporting the original gear I had installed in it two or three years ago and I've only added a few things since then, haven't really improved much on it. Just in case you want to see firsthand how things were two or three years ago, this is what it looked like until now. Even I had trouble figuring out where do these wires go and what they are for. Now, this is what it looked like 10 minutes later after I removed all of the electronics and messy wiring. And this is what it looked like the next day when I was done with the new installation. I think it is becoming quite clear what the advantages of an up-to-date system are. It pretty much looks almost exactly the same as the photo with the electronics removed. You are literally only adding the Matek board and a few cables and this just starts looking so much better. Now, to get things moving, the process of flashing this board with Arduplane is identical to the one for the Omnibus F4 Pro, which you can check out here. But I will quickly go through it. It is pretty straightforward. So, once you get a brand new F405 wing, plug it in the computer and go to the Arduplane firmware download website, the link for which is provided in the description below. Open the latest update and find the Matek F405 wing folder, get in there and download the file that also has with bl.hex in the name. Next, open the Betaflight or iNav configurator, go to the firmware flasher tab, scroll down and select load firmware local, find the file and open it. In a few seconds, the button to flash it to the board will become active, so just press it. Just in case it doesn't work the first time, try again, unplug and plug the board back in the computer, load the firmware and try flashing. At some point, the board will restart in DFU mode and the update will begin. Once done, you can now connect it to Mission Planner. Just select the proper COM port and select the 11.5k baud rate and it should link up just fine. From this moment on, you should also be able to directly update the board via Mission Planner, just like any other Pixhawk board. Just go to the Firmware Install tab, select the firmware needed and just follow the instructions. Plugging in an SD card at some point would be advisable so you can have pretty much unlimited log storage and also the autopilot would have a place where to store the terrain following data it would require for some missions. Now, with the firmware done, and since I have the board connected to the PC, and keep in mind this is before doing anything to it, no soldering, no cables, just the bare board. I like to do the accelerometer calibration now, while the thing is still clean and easy to rotate accurately along the axis. Go to the initial setup tab, open the mandatory hardware sub tab and select accelerometer calibration. Click the top button and just follow the instructions. Rotate the board on every side it tells you to until done. Next, and this is my personal preference, I usually go to the compass sub tab and disable all compasses. Now, again, this is my personal preference and it mostly works on regular planes. A Vito or a Copter will require a compass so you will also need to do this calibration or even if you want to use a compass on a regular plane just click the calibration button and follow the instructions. I am not using a compass so we'll just disable it. At this point the controller is ready to have the pin soldered to it to be placed in the plane and to have everything necessary connected before we can proceed with the setup. I did like the fact that the pins are provided and also that they are different colors so you can more clearly see which are ground, which are power and where there are signal wires without having to necessarily look at the labels. Just makes it easier to work around the board. I did take my time to arrange everything in the correct colors and then remove the bottom plate on the controller so I can solder the pins on. As they are not sticking out the bottom too much, it was a bit more difficult than usual but it got done in no time and the board does look rather nice with all these colors. 
Also, don't forget to solder the pads for the video voltage and the servo voltage. For the servos, just in case you need more than 5 volts, solder those pads together for either 6 volts or 7.2 volts on the servo power line. These pads are on top of the board right behind the ESC soldering pads. The video voltage pads are on the bottom and it just says 12 volts next to the pad. I also soldered that one because I do prefer to have 12 volts on those pins because the Telefly Pro OSD I'm using for my antenna tracker does actually require 12 volts and I will be powering it from those outputs. Now that that was done, I could close up the bottom plate and proceeded to solder on the ESC and battery wires. I did decide to mount this flight controller a lot further forward in the fuselage than it was mounted before, because it would put it right at the CG point, which is always preferable, and would make the battery and ESC wires a lot shorter, thus saving weight and a host of other issues. Soldering these wires was also very straightforward and quick and literally in no time I was ready to install it in the plane and to start plugging stuff in. Since the motor wires coming from the wings were right above the F405 they were the first to be connected and things did start to look very nice. I did mount the board with 3M double sided pads, two of them and it does appear to be quite solid for the time being. Next I had to use longer extensions for the tail servos and had to cut a few extra holes in the foam for wire management but it did work out very nice. After that I also wired in the receiver's S-Bus output and RSSI ports to the flight controller and then I replaced the plug on the GPS cable and extended it a little and finally I reworked the video system wiring a little bit and plugged that in as well and was quite surprised how quickly this upgrade got done. True, I did have to make some of the wires from scratch and that did take a bit of time but still, I was exceptionally happy with the results especially when I was done tidying up those cables. I was no longer ashamed of the state of things inside this plane. And now, with everything wired up, it was time to finalize the autopilot setup using Mission Planner and get the plane ready for flight. Plug in a battery and connect the autopilot to the computer. Make sure you also have the radio at hand and power it up. With the radio receiver now connected, first thing I do is go to the radio calibration tab and click the calibration button. Make sure you have a switch set to channel 8 on your radio because that is the default mode switch for RGU plane. Then just follow the instructions on the screen and move all sticks and switches you would be using to their endpoints and then save it. Next are the flight modes. Since I have a 3 position switch on that channel, I usually go with manual flyby wire a and auto so I can have those auto takeoffs for the maiden flight. Now next is the failsafe tab and especially if you've got a Taranis radio with one of those newer receivers X series and later models you don't need to touch anything on this tab just leave everything as it is. You could set up a battery based failsafe but I never do and unless you specifically need it for something I would advise you just keep away from this tab. When binding a receiver to the Taranis radio, you do have a failsafe option for the receiver. Just select no pulses before binding. In this case, when the receiver loses the radio link, it will stop outputting a signal to the autopilot and the autopilot would know it should go into failsafe, thus enabling the circle mode, followed by the return to home mode a few seconds later. Now moving on, you can skip the ESC calibration tab, I will tell you how I do it. And I find it easier. Plug in the battery so everything boots up, then arm the board, unplug the ESC power wire from the flight controller, don't forget that the battery stays plugged in, give full throttle on the radio, then plug the ESC back in and you will hear the ESC beeps for calibration. They should be two beeps, then throttle down and it will be calibrated. Moving on to the servo output page, this is where you would set up the output channels on the flight controller and in this situation the default order would just not do, since servo 1 and servo 2 on the F405 are motor signal wires, you need to change both to throttle. Then, depending on how you have connected the servos, just choose the appropriate option from the drop down menu. Since the XUAV Clouds is a V-tail plane, I made sure to connect the left fin to output 5 and the 
the right fin to output 6, so respectively that is what I will select from the menu. Having done that, I would then restart the autopilot, which involves disconnecting it from the computer and unplugging the battery. After you plug the battery back in and reconnect it to the computer, switch the plane to either fly-by-wire A mode or the stabilized mode and move the tail up and down to check the direction in which the autopilot will move the control surfaces on the V-tail fins in order to try and counter the movement. When you move the tail up, the control surfaces should go up as well, and when you move it down, they should also go down. If they don't work like that, try hitting the reverse tick box on one of the V-tail channel outputs and see how that changes things. If it's still not good, untick that one and tick the other one. The idea is for the autopilot to start stabilizing in the correct directions. Make sure you do not have any VTL mixing in the radio as it will work against the autopilot's mixing and will make your life much harder and filled with frustration. You can also roll the plane left to right and check if the ailerons are moving in the correct directions. If they are not, just reverse those outputs. Then and only then, switch to manual mode and move the sticks on the radio around and see if the control surfaces move in the correct directions. If they do not, Reverse those channels from the radio, but that is pretty much the only thing you do on the radio. Once all of this is done, I usually go to the config slash tuning tab and then to basic tuning. On this page, I do not change much other than the max throttle the autopilot is allowed to use, since the cloud is a bit overpowered and I do not let it use 100% of the available throttle when in any stabilized or auto mode. Then I move over to the full parameter tree sub tab and first thing I do is to enable the battery sensors. Open the tree and change the 0 to 1, then write the parameters and refresh so it would load up the extended tree for the battery monitor. I would now do it this way because going via the graphical user interface has never worked for me and I am talking from years of experience with ArduPilot at this point. Only thing I usually enter here is the capacity of the battery I am using and in the case of the F405 wing, just leave everything else as it is for the time being and let's move on. Next thing I go to is the OSD parameters, open that up and do the same, just replace the 0 with a 1 to enable it, but this one would require a board restart, so unplug power from the USB and the battery and since we no longer need to set up any servos, you can just plug in the USB cable. Please note that the USB cable would power the board and the radio receiver but will not power the GPS module. So don't be alarmed if that is not working on USB power alone, it needs the battery. So once we're connected again, go back to the full parameter tree, find the OSD subtree and open it. And you will see some new stuff since you can have up to 4 OSD screens that can be independently configured and switched during flight, but I never really use that functionality, so I only configure and use OSD screen 1. To configure it, Mission Planner now has a graphical user interface which makes it a lot easier. Go there and arrange the stuff on the screen to your liking. You can remove some of what is already there and you can add new stuff from the list below and then just drag with the mouse to arrange them. Note the line at the lower end of the image, it tells you how much of the screen would be visible when using NTSC and PAL formats. Since I am using PAL, I will make use of the full screen resolution. Once you're done configuring this, and trust me, it will take at least one more adjustment once you actually see it on the the screen, but that is just how it works. We can now go back to the full parameter tree for one of the last things we will do. Enable the RSSI port. So scroll down until you find the RSSI subtree, then again enable it. The value you need to enter would be either 1 if you have the RSSI on a pin on your receiver or 2 if the RSSI is on a receiver channel. Some receivers would output the RSSI on a channel via the SBUS cable like the R9MM for instance which outputs it either to channel 8 or channel 16 depending on the firmware you have on it. So enter the value specific to your setup, write the parameters and refresh them, 
find the RSSI line again and this time when you open it up you will see a few new things. If you have selected RSSI type 2 you can leave the default channel values especially if you're using a Taranis. Just below that you have to enter which channel is the RSSI channel. So in the case of the R9MM that would be either channel 8 or channel 16. I am using the R9 receiver and I have soldered a cable to its RSSI pad so I need to use a pin on the flight controller, hence why I have selected the analog pin option. The default pin value of 15 is correct for the F405 wing so leave it as it is and the voltage range for the FSKI RSSI on a pin usually is 0 to 3.3 volts so make sure you adjust that to 3.3 volts just in case you're using an FSKI receiver so it would show the scale from 0 to 100% correctly on the OSD. It will work the same if you leave it at 5 volts but when you are at full signal strength you will only only see around 66% RSSI on the OSD. Okay, so this pretty much completes the parameter meddling and there is just one more thing to do though I would advise you not to try this on the maiden flight even though I do, especially if you're completely new to planes or argue plane etc. I absolutely love the auto takeoff functionality and the cloud is by far one of the easiest planes to throw in the air. So I do like to set that up from the get go. Go to the flight plan tab and click somewhere on the map to create a waypoint. It will appear in the list below and you can click the drop down menu for more options. Select the takeoff option and then in the cell to the right select the climbing degrees in order to reach the required altitude. I usually go for 15 degrees but depending on the plane that value can either be higher or lower. Next click the right button and you're done. Now if you have auto on one of the mode switch positions you would be able to do an auto takeoff and I can show you how it works but I do have to repeat that it is advisable people with no or little experience not to do this on the maiden flight. So at the field CG is verified, control surface operation is verified, plane is armed, stabilizing in the correct directions, you arm it by holding throttle low and rudder to the right for 4 seconds. And if all is good it will arm and show that on the OSD. That bracketed D next to the flight modes shows that the plane is disarmed, it will go away when you arm it. Then just flick the switch to the auto mode, motors will spin up and just throw the plane. It is important that you do not swing it back while doing this as it might interpret that as a failed takeoff and switch off the motors just as you are throwing it. And you don't want that to happen. So just assume the throwing position and then flick the switch and throw the plane in one continuous motion. Now in addition to auto takeoff, this cloud's remaiden also resulted in a full autonomous mission on the stock PIDs which are pretty decent if I have to be honest. We'll do some altitude later down the line but for the most part this is all you need to do to get this board in the air and once you get the hang of it it is a pretty straightforward process and quite easy to do. Not to mention that for me at least this is by far the most stable and reliable plane firmware out there. I will end this video here since it already became too long. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. As usual, links for all items shown and used can be found in the description below and buying literally anything through them would support this channel at no additional cost to you and you will have my eternal gratitude as this is my full time job. Another way you can support me is Patreon, the link is also there and I would like to say a big thank you to all the people who have supported me so far in any way and would continue to do so. If you have enjoyed this video and found it useful please feel free to like share and subscribe if you haven't already and also don't forget to hit that bell button so you can be notified when I upload a new video. Also consider following me on Facebook for more regular updates. Happy and safe flying and I will see you in the next one.